So, hello everybody. Uh, here I am with Dan Short, a clinical psychologist, executive director of the Milton H. Erickson Institute of Phoenix, and author of several books about short-term therapy and brief therapy. Hello, Dan. Hello. How are you? I'm doing very good, thank you. Okay. Are you ready for our interview? Yes, of course. Uh, what would you like to ask? So I would like to ask, um, to talk about um, a relationship, because in your web website, I found a very interesting um, sentence about the relationship, therapeutic relationship, a very interesting definition. You say, I quote, um, therapy is a collaborative relationship designed exclusively to meet the needs of the client. That's beautiful. What do you mean? Well, in, in a way, here it's uh, part of the law. Uh, by law, you have what they would call a fiduciary relationship, which means the, the purpose of the relationship and everything that's done within the relationship must be designed to meet the needs of the client. Okay. Yeah. So like if you have an accountant that's got a fiduciary relationship with the person coming for accounting, you, you can't make money yourself off their funds. It, everything you do with their money should be to serve their best interest. Uh, same with like attorneys and, and lots of uh, people with have these uh, sort of privileged positions in people's lives. It's going to be a fiduciary relationship, which means everything you do in the context of that relationship should be uh, aimed at meeting their needs in some way. And so for me as a therapist, if I think this way, uh, that psychologically everything I do must be in service of the needs of the person in front of you, uh, it really helps orient you to um, how to be as effective as possible, even if you're saying a little joke or where you're gesturing for them to sit in your office or if you're quiet or uh, how you sit, if you're leaning forward, leaning back. If you're constantly in your mind thinking, does this meet the needs of the patient in some way? It keeps you sort of laser focused on, on uh, how to create a therapeutic advantage from this get coming together of two people. And for me, uh, that, is, that is really the sole responsibility of the therapist. Hmm. And this is sort of a big point because uh, sometimes people will come in, especially for I do hypnosis. Yeah. And so people come in and they, they, they say, I can't make myself stop smoking or I can't make myself stop being angry. Can you use hypnosis to make me change in some way and when they're asking that question embedded in that is the idea that i'm going to give up on making me do things differently i'm going to sort of give up on being responsible even for what i'm doing mm. and put that burden on you and so now you can try to make me quit smoking or you can try to make me be less angry or something and if as a therapist you buy into that idea you're in a, a, a no-win scenario, uh, and uh, doesn't matter how much hypnosis you use, you, you're not going to get anywhere. And so, one of the things that I learned early on from Milton Erickson is that he believed one of the first things you do in therapy, as you're talking to the person and you're asking, "What do you want to be different?" Mm -hmm. or "What do you want from your session today?" That question is intended to shift the burden of responsibility back to the patient. So the patient recognizes if anything's going to happen, I have to make it happen. I have to do the choosing. I have to do the, uh, the follow through. All of this is it's burden. the burden of responsibility for change should always be on the patient. So if that's the case, what is your burden of responsibility? What is it as a therapist that you must make happen or that you must do right? Where is your skill? Mm. And that goes to me back to the fiduciary relationship. You're responsible for the, re the environment that's created in the office, the relational context that develops. Is it a healthy relationship? Is it respectful? Is it uh, uh, collaborative? Uh, is it uh, reciprocal, whether uh, characterized by cooperation? Yeah. All these healthy dynamics. I believe that as an expert, that's what we must be able to do and do very well. This is very interesting. It's very Ericksonian, of course. Um, yeah. You you study a lot of uh, Milton Erickson um, books, Milton Erickson works, 
and um, uh, you also wrote um, uh, several books about Milton Erickson works, uh, influenced by Milton Erickson works, or specifically about Milton Erickson works. Uh, we have something also in, uh, in Italian, very interesting. Um, what are for you, I have two questions, uh, from a side, what are for you uh, some important skills? Reading uh, Milton Erickson books, what are uh, for you some uh, important skills that Milton Erickson developed to uh, help to build an um, uh, alliance with the client? And uh, the other question is, how is it possible to make a good alliance, a good relationships, even in a few sessions, maybe even in one session? We know that many cases of Milton Erickson, many uh, documented cases, um, um, were treated in just one session. So how is it possible? Because, you know, many theories, many different approaches uh, on psychotherapy uh, say that it's a, you need many sessions to um, to, to build a therapeutic relationship, but often uh, that's not true. Often just one session, just a few minutes are, um, yeah. are okay to do that. Yeah, yeah, and I think we can understand this better if instead of thinking of it as a technique, which is really sort of a superficial way of looking at things, mm -hmm. uh, if you think of it more as, I mean, because maybe a uh, uh, here in the United States, when we, we uh, feel like someone's not being sincere or authentic, we might compare them to the uh, profession of selling used cars. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there's a lot of these individuals selling used cars in America that pride themselves on being able to lie or trick people or manipulate them. And at first they're very friendly and they're hugging you and they're asking all these questions. They have all these techniques that they're using, but there's not a lot of uh, genuineness and authenticity mm -hmm. there. And there's certainly not any care for the person that maybe they're trying to take advantage of and, and you know take you know, sell the car for more money than it's worth and so when i say that techniques you don't want to be like a used car salesman uh instead uh you want it to be uh more a part of what is natural for humans and what we naturally do so imagine that you were um uh on a on a uh a hike or something with some strangers you don't know any of them but there's some sort of mudslide or something and you're swept away and uh, you think you're going to die and uh, you're trying to climb survival and there's this other person that's next to you and you pull one another out of the river and you, you cling to a tree and maybe you're only with each other for three or four hours uh, during this event, but you have this profound connection to one another that potentially lasts you for like the rest of your life. And there, there wasn't a technique that took place. There was just, uh, the the experience itself was so emotional and so important what was happening you're trying to struggle for survival and you're trying to help one another and so the same it is with conversation between two people you go to a cocktail party and you're just discussing events or something and the, the, the chatter is meant to just to be fun and lighthearted you're not going to experience any real bond or connection to that person but uh, you have a conversation that say lasts for 60 minutes, but during the 60 minutes, you're talking about this thing that someone's never told anyone else and it feels like life or death. And maybe they're even questioning whether or not they're, uh, they should continue to exist on this planet. And, and then you show uh, a heightened interest in that and you're reaching out an arm to try and help them. And, uh, everything they say and do really seems to matter to you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gonna, it's gonna be uh, quite a, quite an experience. Yeah. So, so one of the first skills is being able to create a setting when you're talking with someone that they feel safe, secure, uh, and that they can tell you anything that they can trust you, uh, so that they'll go to really deep places inside of themselves. Uh, this is very interesting because you know. Um... I, I don't know the English word, but I remember uh, a book of uh, Jeff Zaig, uh, Erickson, An Introduction to the Man and His Works, I think is the English word. And um, it talked about Erickson's work as the um, uh, common sense therapy. I don't know if uh, it's uh, the good word uh, in, in English. It's a good word for English. It's the right word, sorry. 
in English. Um, a common sense therapy, a good sense therapy. And it, mean that, it means that sometimes it's more simple than we think. Um, it's more uh, going on the observation of what we uh, or who we have uh, um, in front of us. You know, uh, you're saying some, something like that. So here's where Ericksonian therapy becomes different from other therapies. Mm. Uh, most of our other popular therapies now, like say cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, they're all structured around the understanding of how the conscious mind works. And it's kind of assumed that the only real incredible knowledge that you have to work with is whatever you're consciously aware of. Mm. Uh, and Ericksonian therapy is not structured that way. Uh, there is conscious understanding and there's value in conscious understanding, but Ericksonian therapy also emphasizes the importance of reason uh, and uh, decision making and emotions and evaluations that are taking place outside of conscious awareness. Yeah. And so the idea is when you sit in front of a person, your conscious awareness may pick up on 72 different details. And in the time that you've been able to pick up on 72 different details and consciously kind of notice that, uh, your unconscious mind or subconscious has picked up on uh, perhaps anywhere between 6,000 to 10,000 details. Uh, some of them subliminal. Yeah. Uh, some of the movements too subtle for your conscious mind to recognize or even sounds that your conscious is outside the threshold of conscious awareness. But your subconscious is taking in all this information uh, and it's, it's, it's comparing it, it's looking into your catalog of life experiences, any, anything you, any person you've ever spoken to, anything you've ever seen, and, and it's very rapidly, much, much, much faster than what the conscious mind can do. Mm. Uh, it's analyzing and sorting through all this data. And so for Ericksonian therapy, it's not only valid to trust your intuition, it's considered a very important part of interacting intelligently with the person in front of you. So I may be consciously aware, I may be thinking, you know, I've got a fiduciary relationship, I need to meet the needs of this person in front of me. This woman looks very scared and nervous. Uh, I need to help her feel less scared and nervous. And my conscious mind is thinking that. Uh, but for some reason, I just start talking about life on the farm. And I start talking about uh, the joy of going behind a barn and uh, having your own little fort back there, something where no one can find you. And it's a safe place. We're away from the rest of the world. And the person looks at you just in shock and awe. Uh, and, and then after you kind of talk for a little, they say, you know, I grew up on the farm hmm. and I had this fort behind the barn where I would run and I, you know, and they're, they're, it's as if someone just read their mind and who knows how your, your unconscious picked up on it. It's something about the way they walk. I, I remember once I was at a, I was at a store. I just started studying Erickson. I was still like a uh, young out of college and I started reading about Erickson. I was fascinated by what he said about observing people. So I just started observing people like I was in the mall and a, a girl was uh, uh, ringing me up at a register at a very fancy clothing store. And I said, can I make some guesses about you? And uh, I'm just testing myself. And she was like, sure. And I said, uh, you're a college student, right? And she kind of smiled and she was like, yes. And uh, that was kind of an obvious guess because of her age. And she just kind of looked and sounded intelligent. And I was like, you go to such and such university. And she was like, yes. And that was also kind of obvious because that university was kind of, there was three or three universities in this is Dallas, but, but this one was kind of a, you could guess that. And I said, is, uh, is your major chemistry? And then she stepped back and started looking around like this unnerved her. And she was like, how did you know this? And I didn't know at first how I knew her major. And I kind of thought about it. I had to wait for a while. And then it came to conscious awareness. I was like, oh, it's the way you took my credit card because she picked up my credit card and there was a machine to swipe it. And as she was moving the credit card and swiping it, she was holding it so that it was perfectly level. And that's how uh, uh, people that work in labs are trained to do the test tube so they don't spill them. Uh, there's a special way of holding things. Yeah. And I was in a, a chemistry class in high school and it, it must've just 
you know, it registered that her movements, her hands looked like she'd been trained to work in a lab. And so, uh, you know, it's not mind reading, but it, it's little things happening like that. There's, there's too many of them for the conscious mind to keep track of. And the conscious mind can't go through that much memory that quick, but the subconscious can. And so if you're tuned into that, you can take, a, if you can know without asking a person that perhaps they contemplated killing themselves hmm. two days ago, or, you know, these things that take you to really deep, powerful conversations very quickly. Yeah. Oh, uh, th this is amazing. And um, it, give me, it, it gives me a hint for another question because, you know, um, there is a lot of talk about deliberate pra practice, you know, uh, in the last years. I mean, um, uh, therapists can be better therapists uh, practicing their skills, um, of course, during the, the sessions, but also outside the session, outside the, the office. So, um, what you would suggest to improve our skills to be um, uh, more capable to uh, build uh, alliance and relationships with uh, with patients with clients uh, inside the the office and outside the office so what could be a, a good training you, you know what i mean I, I stopped doing my thing where I came up to strangers and started telling them about themselves because I, I found it was too disturbing for individuals and they were uh, wanting to call the police or something. It was just too intrusive. Okay. Uh, so I, I rarely do that now. Although I did, my son and I were recently, he was going off to college. Before we went off to college, we were going to travel backpack around Europe. And I said, let's play a game where we see if we can guess a person's name in, in three guesses. And so we would come up to a stranger. We'd be like, can I try to guess your name in three guesses? And the, the first time I did it, I did get the person's name. The person's name was David, and I got it in third guess. And uh, it was fun uh, to then sit down and kind of explain to my son how we did it. And the, the, that, when we say we're playing a game and it was a father or son, that didn't disturb people. But when I just approached people out of the blue and started telling them about themselves, it really disturbed them. Uh, I had one uh, early on when I was testing this with clients. I thought, what will happen if I have a, a couple come in and they're uh, for marriage couple at counseling and I, uh, I tell them not to tell me anything about themselves during the first 15 or so minutes of the therapy. I'm just going to tell them about themselves. I'm going to tell them how their fights go, who, who starts the fights, who ends the fights, where, you know, each other's behavior. Yeah. And just ways they were sitting on the couch uh, and uh, how they greeted me and so forth. You could kind of tell some of the dynamics that were going on with their... Uh, their attachment styles. And so uh, there's these patterns that I was consciously aware of, and then I was relying some on intuition. And uh, I, I spent about 15 minutes explaining to them uh, how things are and then what they wanted help with. And uh, after I was finished, I was like, is there anything I was wrong on? And they said, no. I said, is there anything that I missed or that should be improved? And they're like, no, that is, that is it. And so I felt kind of proud of myself. I was like, you know, I, these these intakes can be much quicker now rather than me having to listen you know two or three sessions for people to explain everything to me i'll just explain to them all in the first 10 or 15 minutes but that 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 couple right after they had verified that everything i said was correct they almost kind of changed the subject kind of started arguing amongst one another never brought the conversation back to me and then left therapy and then never returned hmm. and then i kind of realized you know, I'm, I'm trying to skip an important step. <laughs> and, and one really important thing is for people to have the experience of, of allowing you to get to know them and of, of taking the risk of sharing things. And there's, there's, a, there's a flow and a process. Uh, and so I've decided since then that it's, it's much wiser to sometimes keep some of your knowledge to yourself uh, and still asking yourself that question in this fiduciary relationship. Is it, is it benefiting my needs to show how much I, I know about them and I can tell about them? Or is it benefiting their needs? I need to make sure it's benefiting their needs. Does this person need this right now? And is this helping them get where they're trying to get? There, there is a thing that I, uh, I have in my mind listening to, to what you just say. Uh, I love the Erickson idea about uh, resistance. You know, uh, Erickson says something like, um, there is no resistance. Resistance is um, 
a way of collaborate, um, uh, a way in which the client is saying to you that this is or this isn't the way it can collaborate with you. Um, yeah. So, uh, how can um, how do you work with resistance clients in the Ericksonian way? How, how, how do you work with people that um, don't want to be here or are very suspicious or are saying in their personal way that being in therapy it's uh, difficult for them that trusting you is difficult uh, you know what i mean yeah um you know i had a i had a vet explain this to me and i felt very stupid when she was explaining this to me but uh, i would uh, i'd had a dog uh, cared very much for this dog and she was very well behaved and I never had her on a leash or anything. She would, you could literally just talk to her as if you're talking to another human being. And she would, she somehow knew. You know, we'd go to a vet and I'd tell her, go over there and stand on the scales. And the dog would just go walk and stand on the scales. And I, it, 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 it was pretty impressive how responsive she was. And then uh, one day I've been telling her she needed to go outside and I was reaching to pet her or something. And then she growled and bit at my hand and didn't actually didn't didn't harm me but she snapped at my hand and this really upset me i was like why is this dog you know disobeying me that's the way i took it and i got very angry and upset with her and then i was telling the vet about it when we went back to see the vet uh that she had snapped at me i didn't understand this and she was like well she's getting she's having a pain in her back from where uh someone had uh injured her and she was like uh, uh she was just trying to tell you that even though you thought you were just petting her you were hurting her and she was trying to tell you that hurts, please yeah. stop. And then I felt all bad because I gotten mad at her. <laughs> it's like, you know, cinnamon, never snap at me. You know? <laughs> and as I was being mad at her, the poor thing was, was hurt and she was just trying to let me know, but with the only way she could. Uh, and it's the same with clients. Sometimes when you tell a client, you know, uh, here's what you're going to do or tell me this or, and then they say yes and they, they're, they, it's, they say they're going to do what you want, but then they're really not doing what you want, uh, or they respond poorly to you. Without being able to have the intellectual awareness or the introspective awareness or the language to tell you, ouch, this hurts, you're, you're scaring me, or this is painful for me, or this makes me feel too controlled, or whatever, they, they make a response that's that can seem like a rejection or defiance or something that we don't like. Hmm. And so that uh, misunderstanding can be cleared up if you're thinking to yourself, what are they trying, to, what are they struggling with? What is hard for them? What are they unable to do here? Or what are they fearful of? Hmm. And uh, you keep trying to pursue that line of questioning uh, not an insulting way. It's more kind of a private dialogue, but you're, you're, you're asking more questions about, well, could you do this? Or have you tried this? Or how does it feel if I'm saying this? Or what just went through your mind? Or, and then you'll find out what the person's, there's always something there that they're struggling mm -hmm. with. Uh, and they just couldn't tell you what they were struggling with. Once that's addressed, there is no more problem with resistance. And typically, if, if we want to ask what goes wrong most often in therapy, uh, I've done a little bit of research on this uh, just by collecting data at the end of the session on what clients kind of struggle with most, uh, looking at all these different possible things. And the one that comes up most often for most clients is uh, the, the therapist expects me to do more than I'm capable of doing. Oh. Lots of people develop that feeling that you're going to try to, you know, that they're going to fail because you think they can do this much and they only feel they can do this much. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not going to want to have to come back and tell you that they failed or they didn't do it or they did it wrong or so we're very sensitive about that. Again, it seems to me that it's, um, again, observing and listening. Uh, uh, Michael Lloyd, uh, I know you know it, uh, loves to say insistence produces resistance. So it's uh, like, don't do that. If that way it's not good for your client, 
choose another way. Ask to the client what is the best way for him. Um, another fascinating thing I'll do sometimes because I, I like to give people things that they can be working on, they can be doing in between sessions. And so I'll describe something and clients like that. They, they, want, they want to be trying to make things better and know what they should do. And so I'll give them something to work on and uh, some skill to develop or try. And I'll say, does that sound good to you? And they're saying, yes. And I'll, I'll ask them first as a yes or no question. Do you think that you'll do this? And then they say, yes. And then, then I switch from a yes or no question, which is all or nothing thinking to a more of a scale by using percentages. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, what is the percentage of possibility from zero to a hundred that you're going to do this thing that I'm giving you. In other words, 0% means there's no way in the world you're going to do it. A hundred percent means I could bet a million dollars on it, that you're going to do this. Where are you at? And they're like, about 34%. <laughs> or, you know, 30%. And I, at 30%, I'd say, do you realize that means there's a 70% <laughs> thing that I just gave you? And they're like, yeah, I think that's about right. I said, okay, well, let's see if we can change the, the nature of the, the exercise so that we can at least get it up to 50 50 because then we've at least got it as good as random chance that you'll follow through and do this. <laughs> then I can start asking some questions. What would get it from, you know, 30 up to 35 or up to 40? Like how can we change this? And then you start getting the person invested in telling you, well, I need it to be this thing, or I, I, I don't like this part of it, or for me, it has to be this. And then that there's that thing where you're shifting responsibility to the client uh, for their own actions and for their own follow through and for them doing their treatment. And uh, as you're learning more about them with this kind of questioning, they're starting to learn more about themselves. Yeah. And starting to think of their own intentions versus the, the probability of action and how to reconcile these two things within themselves. Yeah, that's great. So um, I want to ask a, a, last, a last question, an off topic question, because uh, um, I know you wrote. Uh, a, a new book about uh, Milton Erickson and William James, uh, a sort of a comparison between to, uh, these two genius. And yeah. um, is there something uh, studying Milton Erickson and studying uh, William James and comparison him? Is there something that you think that can be useful for who wants to know how to improve? Um, is scales about uh, how to build a relationship with, with clients. Yeah. I mean, imagine that you've grown up in a city all your life uh, and uh, you meet someone who's in the city trying to explain to you how to use farm skills and farm knowledge to interact with people and do therapy better, much as was Milton Erickson. Milton Erickson was uh, you know, constantly using things he learned from watching animals and, and relationships between people and animals or between animals, and then how these dynamics played out. Imagine that someone's trying to tell you that, and all you know is subways and bus schedules and skyscrapers, and you've never even seen a cow. Mm. And then imagine that while you're trying to understand that person, someone else takes you to a farm and walks you around the farm and introduces you to the cow and introduces you, you know, uh, it's that depth and level of understanding that you just could not get any other way. It's just impossible to have as good an understanding of what this means without going to the farm. And it's, when I, this analogy, it's not that William James himself is a farm, but <laughs> William James created the philosophical world that surrounded Erickson when he went to college. Uh, uh, you know, the psychology book at the time was The Principles of Psychology written by William James. And in it, uh, James laid out the foundation for this worldview that much of Erickson's uh, therapy and approach to people grew up out of. And so it's like, I guess it's almost like being able to go back to the family farm that Erickson grew up on and see that family farm. And then you're like, 
that's what these ideas mean. That's, you know, it's the same words you've always read. You've read them in, in several different books, but with this uh, other background, uh, you sh the, the, there's whole new dimensions that these I ideas start to take on. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, Dan, uh, I would like to have a two hours interview with you talking about Ericsson and talking about relationships and strategies. But um, uh, thank you for, for your time. And uh, yeah. I hope to see you soon, maybe in person. Okay. And um, see you next time. Yes, it's a pleasure talking with you. A pleasure to me. Thanks. You bet.